Hello, hello, hello. This is Andy Orfalco, Canine Academy. I am uh, so happy to see you here. Uh, we're going to be talking about a few things uh, in regard to the dogs from uh, Northern Ireland. And um, we're going to be going into a little bit of dog training in our Pet Dog Training 101. And the reason I'm doing them together, because they go hand in hand. And it's going to be able to give you an idea of what it is that I do with the dogs when they first arrive here, no matter whether they're for bed bug detection, narcotics, or police dogs that are being trained to hunt down, uh, you know, felony suspects, it, it really is all the same. Uh, and the first one to two weeks are critical for the success of the training process and then the, uh, the handing the dog over to the eventual handler uh, who's going to end up, you know, spending hopefully the rest of the uh, uh, the dog's life with them. Sometimes uh, they get new handlers in the middle of a, of, a, of their time being in service, but in most cases, most handlers uh, take their dog and then stay with that dog for the entirety of that dog's service. But the first two weeks are critical. And so we have Ollie and Flash here who arrived from Northern Ireland. I told you a little bit about the story about some of the the happenings about getting them here, which was not, for whatever reason, just was not in the cards to be the easiest uh, thing for all of us here to do. And uh, it, it took a little bit of extra effort to get the dogs here and to actually get them from, uh, you know, the the shipper, or uh, which was Lufthansa, and then uh, customs, getting through customs, as I explained. If you want to know more about that, go ahead and, and scroll down. You'll see the video on that particular update. Today, though, I want to do, you know, I know one of the most popular uh, videos on YouTube uh, for people to watch are the unpacking uh, videos. And so I'm going to unpack this package here. And, and I know it's very exciting to watch unpacking, but I'm going to go ahead and do this. I've lost the opportunity to unpack on a couple things that I've uh, gotten from Amazon. Um, but this one's very unusual. I bet you almost none of you, other than those of you that are in one of our private groups, our private group called the Bed Bug uh, Detection Dog Secret Group, which you can find, uh, incidentally, if you go to the left margin of this Facebook page, this uh, of the Falco Canine Academy Facebook page, and click on Groups, you'll see that there's a, a link to get into that private group. So if you have a bed bug dog or interested in um, training your own bed bug detection dog, you may want to be a part of that secret group. Um, it is a safe, secure group for all of our members, but um, none of you, I am sure, that aren't in that group have ever received a package like this where inside, wow, they did a really good job of packaging this. Uh, I, this is exciting, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know why unpacking videos are one of the most popular videos on YouTube. I'm really, I've never, oh, well, I watched them just to see what everybody was watching. Um, but this is what they are. You're, you're unpacking a package of some product or something that you bought. There we go. But how many have ever received? Now, I'm going to tell you about another package that I used to receive on a regular basis that I, I too uh, can be almost guaranteed that you'd never received them. So, here, I got four vials, and inside these vials are little tiny bed bugs. Now I'm going to come around and see if actually the camera can pick up. Let me see. So inside there, do you see those little black things in there? Oh, there you go. Those are little tiny bed bugs. You see them? They should be moving towards my hand because they are attracted by heat. Where I am holding, there is a um, uh, a screen. And the dog, the bugs, the dogs, the bugs can actually smell my human odor. Sorry, I'm going out of the view there. And will eventually work their way up. Sorry. <laughs> it's hard to keep it. Uh, yeah. They've probably been dormant for a long, for a good period of time there. And yeah, let me wake these guys up. They're alive. Oh, there is one moving around. So I just couldn't see it on the camera. So do you see him moving around there? Now he's going towards my hand. There you go. So now you see that he's making his way towards my hand. So that one's getting there. Let's see, is there another one moving in there? They're too, they're too far down. But um, you can see that one was moving towards the, the heat that, that was coming through that screen. So those are bed bugs. Those just arrived today. We got four vials and each one of the vials, I think I have five bugs. I do. Uh, let me just make sure those other ones are alive. 
Yep. And so that's the exciting day when we get packages. Quite often we have packages of bed bugs. And again, I bet none of you other than our bed bug people can say that you've ever received anything like that. Uh, the other package that we used to uh, get all the time <laughs> is that when I was training dogs for the state of California for a grant that we were involved in, uh, in regard to um, E. coli salmonella detection, is that the thing we were training on was uh, fecal contamination. So I used to get shipped uh, packages of uh, coyote uh, fecal matter, um, deer fecal matter, rabbit, uh, and some human, yes, <laughs> I would get a package FedEx uh, of, um, of, of poop. And so again, I would just laugh that, uh, here I was this, um, fairly successful police officer. I had awards and things like that. And I was teaching all over the world and doing stuff. And here I am getting packages of poop in the mail, pretty exciting. And now I'm getting bugs. And so there we go. That was my unpacking. Um, so uh, so we're going to be using these for the training of the dogs. Uh, we had some other vials that had one or two bugs that were still alive, but now we got some fresh bugs. So uh, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be going through some of the processes where we're imprinting the odor of those live bed bugs into the dog's uh, olfactory system, olfactory system, uh, and then teaching the dog how to search for the live bed bugs. So you're going to see some of that. We'll probably do more of that in our private group. So this broadcast right now is simulcasting in uh, our Healthy Dog Network uh, Facebook page in our um, um, uh, bed bug detection dog secret group. And, and I think a couple others, I'm not sure. Um, probably a police dog recruit, uh, Facebook page. If you want to comment or you have a question, you will want to go to the top of the page and make sure that you're in the Falco canine Academy Facebook page. So if you're, in, if you're watching this and you're in uh, the healthy dog network, click on the link that will send you to Falco canine Academy's Facebook page. And then when you comment, I can see it. But if you comment, Right now, and you're in one of those other groups, I won't see it on this page that I'm working from right now. All right. So now let's talk about um, what happens when these dogs get here. And uh, the um, the most important thing is that when dogs arrive, uh, especially after flying 14 hours from Europe and uh, a layover, possibly in Paris um, or um, uh, London, and then flying over the, uh, you know, the Atlantic and then across the United States and then landing is that the dogs have been through a, 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 a bit of, you know, experience that they've never experienced before where uh, they grew up in a kennel. Uh, these dogs are a year old and the crates undoubtedly get knocked around and you got the, you know, the issues with flying as a, as a whole where there's uh, turbulence and that kind of stuff. And then they get to the cargo and they got to sit there. They're lifted up by a forklift and they're moved somewhere and then put down and then slid across and then put in a truck. And then the back of the truck, they're driven across the freeway <laughs> uh, from LAX to Orange County. You can imagine uh, a year old dog who has lived in a kennel most of its life and all it knows is playing with a tennis ball and searching for it, you know, here and there, that that experience can be pretty challenging. So you get them here uh, and you want to make sure that when they do get here, that the experience now becomes pleasant again. And it is particularly pleasant with the pr people that are going to train the dog. So namely me or the other people that are going to be caring for the dog and training the dog also. And so for the first week or two, it is really important, regardless, again, whether it's a German Shepherd, Belgian Malinois, uh, Labrador Retriever, that that experience is a positive one coming in and out of the crate, uh, getting let outside, that kind of stuff. Now, Labrador Retrievers um, are mostly fun, loving, social dogs. But uh, when going through all of what I just described, you know, sometimes they can uh, become a little bit hesitant to come out of a crate or hesitant to go into a new environment because their experience with going into a new environment, a uh, you know, also known as the crate or into the belly of a plane, is that oh my god, you know, the last time I went into a new place, it was horrible right? Um, the, the, the clanging that may happen and the bouncing and the, the people that are sticking their fingers in the crate, whatever that is, could be a bad experience. So the dog goes from living in a kennel in Northern Ireland to suddenly going into what it's, it's attaching to as a, as a new experience. Now, any new experience, they're going, okay, wait a minute, the last time this happened, blah, blah, blah. So you want now that their next new experience is not negative, that their next few experiences are positive. So coming out of the crate, um, you want them to go into a place that's safe. 
You want them to um, then go maybe into the front yard and again, where it's safe and try not to do too much obedience if you can, grabbing them by the collar, making them stop yelling at them or doing stuff like that. And so you have to set up for success. Uh, you don't want to just simply always just open a door and then hope for the best. Because what can happen is the dog gets scared and now they run down the street and they, they run, you know, maybe even into the street. A car happened to become, they, they, they squeals to a halt, a horn honks. And then now you can see how now the uh, snowball begins to get bigger and bigger because now you've not set up for success. So you want to uh, get a hold of the dog, put them on a leash so that you can maintain control. Uh, you want to be careful with the leash because maybe the dogs like uh, Flash and Ollie have not had a lot of experience on leash. And that's at least, um, that's what I saw right away. As soon as I put it on the leash, they're kind of looking at that thing like, what is this you're attaching to me and why is it connected to me? Uh, but you, um, you really have to make a determination. Is it more important to keep them under control or that you lose control and have them go and, and get some horrible experience by running out in the street? And so, of course, you weigh on the side of security and hook them up to a leash. But now you have to make sure that experience on the leash is a good one because the leash in the end is going to be an important part of the training process and the handling process and that kind of stuff. So everything is measured. And I know that this seems like over analyzing stuff, but it's not. It really is step by step finding out what it is that's going to um, uh, occur with your dog and that kind of stuff. So let me go ahead and go to my presentation and I'm going to give you a, a list of things that are really important for you to uh, be aware of and <clears throat> and go through it step again step by step hold on I mean, i'm clicking on the wrong button there all right so let's go to the this um the slide i'm gonna go to keynote presentation now i'm gonna be going back and forth between the presentation and the camera and so um I, I've titled this Dog Training 101, First Build Trust. And so that is really the key, right? You want to build trust with the dog, especially a dog that has no clue who you are, right? My, um, you know, Chris Hanlon uh, up in Northern Ireland and his children and uh, quite possibly anybody that's working in the kennel, the dog has experience with. They, they have an accent, number one. <laughs> uh, they probably smell different. The, um, the weather and temperature in Northern Ireland is not what it is in Southern California. And so you can see right away, we have a whole bunch of differences. So now they come into an environment. I think when they arrived, it might've been around the eighties or nineties. And so the temperature is different. It's a drier, um, you know, environment. And now you have people that speak differently and act differently. And so, uh, of course, now we're going to need the dogs to trust us, right? And to trust these new people in this new environment that's really, really hot. All right, so we need to build trust. This goes for your pet dogs too. Um, your pet dog uh, that you either got at a shelter or rescue or from a pet store or from a neighbor whose dog just had puppies, that 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 building of trust is really key to a long-term relationship between you and your dog. So step one for pet dogs and detection dogs is building uh, trust. All right, uh, so one thing you wanna do is you want to make sure and watch the dog. Watch everything that is happening um, it, with the dog in a safe environment like the backyard. I'm not so sure that bringing them into a house right away is the most, um, uh, I don't wanna say smart, what's the other word I'm looking for, uh, is, is more as important as bringing them into maybe somewhere outside that should be safer. There's less things for the dogs to run into uh, and to have it fall over on his head, like a trash can, for instance, or a table or a lamp you know, one of those lamps that kind of stands in the corner. Um, it's really easy for those kinds of things to fall over and immediately have a bad experience being inside that house. So uh, outside in general, uh, other than my house where we have a pool, which I had a couple police dogs from Europe fall in the pool right away. They didn't had they've never seen one and they just walk on it. They think that it's going to be something they can walk on and they, they land in the pool. So other than the pool, uh, the backyard is mostly a safe environment. And so you want to look for things that the dog likes. What is it the dog is immediately attracted to? And that could be both negative and positive, right? And so is the dog attracted to looking at the fence and seeing how it can get over, right? The dog likes to jump over the fence and then run. We don't want, we want to make sure and be aware of that. Does the dog like, um, you know, the furniture and does it start chewing on the furniture right away? Does it uh, investigate uh, other things that, you know, could lead to um, trouble? Uh, does it like, um, you know, the toys that are out there for the children and be, oh, right away begin chewing on them. Those are really important to figure out what your dog likes. Does a dog like you? Does a dog like your children? Does a dog like the other dogs, right? Really know what your dog likes. And of course, what goes with that is what does your dog dislike? Um, what right away with one of the dogs, um, 
we saw the dog dislike the sound of a stainless steel bowl on the ground. And so uh, all of the bowls that we use to both feed the dog and uh, quite often give the dog water are stainless steel bowls. And we noticed right away that as soon as the dog went to go eat the food and he pushed the stainless steel bowl and it made the sound that stainless steel makes on concrete, he jumped back and said, what the heck is that? And now we had trouble going back to eat the food. So right now I know that this dog dislikes sounds that it doesn't understand, particularly metallic sounds when it's on concrete. Important, super important, because now that is something I want to make sure and get the dog over. And I want to spend some time doing that. So really, really important. So I file that away that this dog doesn't like stainless steel sound on concrete. Um, what are his fears? Now that it could be a dislike or a fear. The reason I have them separately is because something that the dog doesn't like is extremely different than what the dog fears. So um, is the dog afraid of other dogs, right? Is the dog afraid of going into a crate? Is the dog afraid of people? Is the dog afraid of children? Uh, with in regard to bed bug detection dogs, that would not be good because we take our dogs into residential homes where quite often there are children and um, and other things, uh, other people that the dog will come in contact with. So we want to make sure that the dog doesn't have a fear of people and in particular, uh, not a fear of children. Um, uh, neurotic behaviors. You know, this you may not see in the first couple of days, but you'll see it eventually. A neurotic behavior is like chasing your tail, um, uh, licking its paws, um, biting itself, uh, you know, randomly, not because of an allergy, not because of a skin irritation, uh, or licking you, uh, licking your skin over and over again. That could be a neurotic behavior. Um, uh, staring at shadows. Uh, you know, when it sees its shadow, the dog will all of a sudden get distracted by its shadow. We don't want neurotic behaviors, or at least we want to keep them to a minimum because neurotic behaviors can cause the dog not to be effective as a detection dog. As a pet dog, it can just be plain old irritating, right? If you have a dog and I, we get them all the time, not all the time, but often we've had them uh, where dogs have this licking neurotic behavior where it just continually licks the human being's arms and legs. And, and uh, it just, after a while, and at first it's cute. And you're thinking, oh, how nice, my dog loves me. And then after a while, you're thinking, okay, stop. All right, I've had enough. <laughs> stop licking me. Uh, but that is can be a neurotic behavior, chasing the tail and that kind of stuff. And so you want to be aware of those things. Um, social issues, dogs, people, or both. You want to make sure that you, when you take your dog now out in the public, how does it handle seeing other people? Is it afraid of people? Is it um, uh, extremely attracted to people? That That is really hard. With the detection dog, that can be problematic uh, because, again, we're searching around people. And as you're doing your search, if somebody suddenly walks in, you don't want your dog to stop searching and then go and always greeting somebody that new, that's new that may have walked into the search area and stop your search, right? So really important. So, again, these are, these are really, uh, really good pieces of information <clears throat> that are either going to help you. Uh, or they're going to be things that you want to work on to try to get the dog over it. Uh, critter obsession. Critter obsession is squirrels, right? Uh, birds, uh, as you are walking, does the dog now see a squirrel and will not leave it? Uh, that's particularly, this kind of thing happens with, uh, in regard to um, uh, Jack Russell Terriers and rats or mice. If they hear a rat or mice, you, you're going to have a real tough time getting that dog to focus back on something else because it becomes obsessive and almost neurotic about the sound of a mouse and will not let it go, will not leave it alone. And you're gonna have a really tough time trying to get that dog to go back into searching if it hears a rat in the wall or a mouse in the wall and you have to try now try to search that room. So you wanna make sure that your Labrador retrievers are also not critter obsessed. Um, environmental issues, what is it that the dog is concerned about? I, I guess the stainless steel bowl could be a little bit of an environmental issue. Um, but uh, in, 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 in what I'm talking about here it has to do more with uh, slick floors, uh, stairs and that kind of stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to my camera here for just a second. And so, oops, wrong tool. And so um, these things that you're gonna watch for, again, may not show up right away, right? You may not see a neurotic behavior because there's so many new things the dog is interested in that you may not see the chasing of the tail or the licking of the paws or biting itself or whatever it is that this dog may have as a neurotic behavior because there's too many things that are new that are um, uh, occupying the dog's brain. But two or three uh, days down the road, a week down the road, these behaviors will begin to show show up. Um, that's why I say the first two weeks are critical because this is where you're gonna begin to see the issues. Uh, aggression, you may not see for the first week or week and a half. Um, dogs are so busy, concerned about their environment that they're not showing their aggression because they're not feeling that they have 
possession of the property or possession of something like the bowl or possession of a toy or possession of a of a chair, a garden chair that's outside or even a couch on the inside that now they've taken as theirs. And so once it does become theirs, now you'll see the aggression or they've not decided whether they like you or not. You know, maybe in the beginning they like you because they go, oh, this new human being is giving me food and attention. But now they decide, you know what? I really, you really irritate me. It's kind of like that thing uh, when you start dating somebody, you know, those things that were cute in the beginning, like an accent or the way they, uh, you know, uh, do something, um, uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you think in the beginning is really cute. And then later on, that's the very thing that you can't stand about that person. <laughs> and so that happens with dogs too. I'm getting looked at over here. <laughs> There's nothing like that. And so, um, those things in the beginning are, Oh, you know, I really like how, uh, you are able to, to lick your eyebrows, you know, but later on you go, you know, that's really irritating that you lick your eyebrows. Right. So in the beginning it's funny and cute. And then later on, not so funny and cute. So, uh, with dogs, they're like that with you, like, Hey, a new human being. And they're really cool. You know, oh, I really don't like that human being. Oh, I hate that human being. You know, what? I'm going to bite that human being. And so this is something that happens or even children, you know, the, the, again, the dog could be so concerned about the environment that they don't notice the children. But once the dog has sniffed everything in the environment, Later on, the children become an irritant, and now you see that's when you will see the aggression. All right, so um, that's why one to two weeks, and sometimes even up to four weeks, are necessary to uh, keep an eye on a dog and see what's happening. All right, let's go back to the uh, presentation here. So, I think that the next slide is that I'm talking about the very thing that I just brought up. <laughs> All right. Oop. Oh no, I didn't want to do that. Sorry about that. Let's go here. All right. Some behaviors or personality traits will not show up for two to. Uh, two to four weeks. All right. That's what I just talked about. All right. Let's go to this. Sorry. All right. Based on these observations now, now what is it that we're going to do? Um, so some of the things you're going to see immediately, right? You're going to see uh, a few things in regard to fear. Um, I saw once we fed uh, a flash that he didn't like uh, the sound of the metallic uh, bowl against the uh, concrete. Um, I saw that both of them really did not know what to do with the leash on. It really, they caught, as soon as I put it on, they started backing up and really not sure what to do with the leash. Not a big deal. It's just something that sometimes we have to work on. Sometimes it's not even a big issue. But with every dog that we get, there's something, right? There's always something that we have to try to help the dog understand or help the dog get over. And so right away we saw that both dogs had an issue with the leash. And so right now I'm playing ball with the dogs on a leash. So what is a potential deal breaker for a positive relationship? So in these early observations, you want to make sure, and this is one of the things I try to do right away. Now, for sure, one of the things I don't want to happen with these dogs from Northern Ireland is to see something that is a deal breaker. But if I do, I want to identify it and get out of it right away. Uh, what we call it in the business, um, the business world is fail fast. You want to fail really fast. So if you hire somebody and right away you see that they are not a fit for your organization, you want to fire them right away, right? You don't want to say, well, let's see how they work it out because it's going to be harder to fire them because now they have, uh, you know, uh, a, a greater chance of suing you, <laughs> right? Uh, because now they're saying, hey, you know, they let me work there and they knew I had this issue and now they let me go. And so there's the longer you wait, the more headache it can be. They begin to steal from you and that kind of stuff. So if you find, if you feel funny about something, that it's not working, you want to get out of it quick. If you're trying a new tool and the tool is not operating, you, you know, you don't want to keep trying to use something that's not working. You want to get out. So the dog is the same thing. The dog comes over and right away you get or growling or you uh, you see the dog, you know, hesitates going inside for a bed bug dog does not want to go inside the house. Now, both these dogs have no hesitation coming into this house. Uh, if they see any kind of light, they are in the house and they are running around like crazy and <laughs> they have no, no environmental issue whatsoever whatsoever coming into a building. So I know that not, but if they did, if I open the door and they backed up or I tried to drag them in, not, I wouldn't drag them, but if I tried to get them into the room and it took maybe dragging to get them in, then I would say, hmm, this is potentially a deal breaker. Then I would have to really start to evaluate that aspect of it and decide, is this a deal breaker? And do I need to send the dogs back to Northern Ireland uh, and get new ones or what? do I need to do? So what is the potential for a deal breaker uh, for a positive relationship? The next thing is, wow, that transition is really slow. What issue needs to be addressed first? So um, in regard to these dogs, I think for me, uh, from everything I've seen, the thing that I need to deal with first is the leash issue. And so what I was talking about a minute ago is that now every time I get the dogs out, I'm putting on some type of leash. So I have just a regular six foot leash. I also have a, um, uh, a retractable line that I use. 
Um, I don't like the retractable lines for pet dogs, but for service dogs, I do like the retractable lines for some aspects of training the dog and using it for a tool. And so I use that. And that is really funny for the dogs because it makes a sound as it goes out. It goes zzz as it goes out. And then as it comes back, you hear clicking noises and that kind of stuff. So it, it is one of those things that we want to make sure the dogs get over. And so every time I take the dogs out and play fetch with them, they're either on the six footer or I'm using the a retractable to play ball and to give them treats and that kind of stuff. So for these dogs, that's one of the things I want to address first. For you with a pet dog, it may be different, right? It may be that the dog is having trouble warming up to the other human beings within the household. So that might be really important, right? So if you have a pet dog that's going to, you're going to want to have uh, be a member of your family and you want to address it, whether this is going to be a deal breaker that the dog does not uh, like the other people, it doesn't go to them maybe, or it pees on the ground when somebody approaches, particularly the, the male uh, dominant, uh, you know, father or something like that, the dog sees him and pees right away. Uh, that could be a deal breaker because quite often, you know, the dads are saying, Hey, you know, I can't have this. Every time I walk in, the dog pees on the ground, right? And he gets angry and says, you know, that dog's got to go. Um, and so that may be one of the things you want to address first. And that would, ha that would uh, take, look like, uh, you know, maybe giving dad, if he's willing to, uh, you know, some pieces of hot dog and say, Hey dad, every time you see, you know, Sammy, the dog, um, you know, what, give him a couple pieces of hot dogs. Don't try to pet him right away because that hand coming over the top of his head is really hard for a dog to visually understand because maybe if it's a rescue dog, that's, you know, one of the things that used to happen to them is that they'd be, you know, smacked in the head. So really just give them a hot dog and then let the dog be. Don't try to pet it. Don't try to grab it. Don't try to grab it by the collar. Don't do anything. Just let the dog come to you and get that tasty treat of a hot dog and start with that and then work up to touching, right? And give really good direction as to each human being that needs to do that. If it's a child, you know, monitor it, be careful, maybe get some professional assistance, but that may be the thing you want to address first because it's going to be the deal breaker, right? Whether it gets along with the human beings or not. All right. Next thing is, uh, is it a medical issue, a trainable issue, or is it acceptable? So there's some things that are medical, right? And so uh, you want to make sure and address at, that as it is. So in regard to police dogs, and this is the easiest way uh, thing for me to talk about uh, because that's a, what I've been doing the longest. If we are training a police dog and we're doing bite work and this dog is not biting firmly, let me go ahead and come back to my camera. Now that's going to cause me a problem, but it's okay. But I have to use my hands <laughs> to describe what's happening here. All right. So if we have a police dog coming up and biting the sleeve, and when it bites the sleeve, it, it, it turns and now bites with one side of the mouth or the other, right? So the dog comes to bite. What we want to train the dog to do is bite firmly the whole arm, right? Get its whole mouth on that arm. If we have a dog early on come up, bite, and then immediately slip down to the front of its teeth or the side of its teeth, you know, one of the things we look at, well, maybe that dog just wasn't trained properly to take a full bite. Maybe if we do a use a bungee cord and we can use a bungee cord on the dog's leash or his harness when the dog bites and he, when he doesn't bite firm, he loses the bite. That's going to make the dog go, oh, I wanted that bite even more. And that's one tool we use to create a stronger and more full bite by using a bungee cord system. Or we uh, reward the dog when he does fight, bite firmly. We give him the sleeve, right? Those are all training techniques and things that we use to create a better bite in the dog. However, if the dog has a medical issue, that it will never work, right? None of those training techniques will work if the dog has an abscess in one of its teeth, which is not allowing the dog to bite. It actually hurts or it's uh, got a loose tooth or there's some decay that just simply needs to be cleaned out because the plaque has gotten so bad. Now the dog bleeds when it bites and it's a bad thing. So the medical issue is actually the first thing you want to look at, which we often forget in police dogs and detection dogs. We always try to fix things with training. Um, with pet dogs, it can be the same thing because, it, you know, um, it's expensive <laughs> to go to the vet and we're going, maybe we could, if we just did this differently, or if we just worked on this and, and actually it can be a medical issue, right? If the dog is, is, uh, aggressive, you know, it could be that the hips are sore. It could be that it has a vertebrae problem. It could be that its elbows are sore. And so when a child comes up, the dog's going, Oh, that kid always wants to play, you know, and you know, I just don't want to play today. And so the dog chooses to growl, to get the child to go away. And it's not because the dog is aggressive towards children. It's because the dog does not want to be played with because it hurts or it's uncomfortable. So you take the dog to the vet. Let's, let's um, make sure that that's not the issue, that it has some type of injury or illness or um, uh, you know something that can be fixed with just a little bit of medication. 
Um, and particularly a dog that you're just bringing into your house, if it's a medical issue that's going to cost you a couple thousand dollars to fix, that could be a deal breaker, right? Uh, and you don't want to find that out after you've fallen in love with the dog. So the medical issue is going to be one of those things that you want to look at first, uh, especially if you can say, you know what, sometimes I've seen that this occurs because the dog has this ailment, right? So take the dog to the vet, have them checked out. And that's one of the reasons why we have all of our dogs uh, completely x-rayed. Uh, these dogs from Northern Ireland were completely x-rayed. Uh, and I'm sent the x-rays um, by the veterinarian who I've met when I've gone to Northern Ireland. I've met Barry. Uh, he's a really good guy, has a good practice. And I can be sure that the, the x-rays are from these dogs. Why is that important? If you're ever importing dogs from Germany, uh, Belgium, um, uh, the Netherlands, uh, it, what happens, and this happens uh, a lot, is that you get the x-rays from another dog who's healthy and they send them to you as if they're the dog that you're purchasing. So you gotta be really careful. You'll get x-rays of another dog that has no relationship to the dog that you uh, are, are shipping over. So be very, very careful. Uh, one of the things I do is I always go to Europe first, meet the people that I'm going to be dealing with, the vendors and the uh, veterinarians to make sure that I can trust them and, and have discussions with them and get uh, referrals and all that kind of stuff. So um, medical is really, really important. All right, I'm gonna go back to my, my page here and I'm just gonna leave it right here. Uh, instead of trying to um, go through it again. All right, so the next thing is it medical trainable, uh, if it's trainable, and then acceptable. Is it acceptable? Actually, it, it makes more sense if I do it this way. Sorry, I changed my mind. Da, 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 da. Okay, so is it acceptable? There's some things with your dog. So like, let's just say the dog sits crooked, uh, right? The dog, you know, when you have the dog sit, if if you are going into some type, if your plan is to get the dog to go into competition, obedience competition, um, you cannot, if you're going to try to, if you want to win, if you want to get medals or if you want to place, um, you can't have a dog that says crooked because you're going to get marked down, right? If you have a dog that has a slow sit or you have a dog that has a slow down, like my police dog, he took forever to lay down, always, his entire career. Uh, I even learned some techniques to speed up the down, but he just, you say plots which is the German command for down, and he would saunder to the down position. Uh, we improved upon it so he would down faster and swat deployments and that kind of stuff, but it never really was the firm, hard down where you can actually hear him hit the ground. Never, 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 never. So if I wanted to um, increase his scores in Schutzen, which he was a Schutzen three, but the lowest score he had was in obedience and mostly because of his down, um, and I wanted to get a high score, I would have to either accept that he has a, a slow down or get a different dog, right? So you have to decide if you uh, have a dog that has a certain thing that he does, if you're just going to say, you know what, I'm not competing with this dog. I actually love this dog. He looks pretty cool. Who cares if he sits crooked, right? So that's one of those things that you decide whether it's acceptable or not. If you are the type of person who like aggressive dogs, Maybe him being aggressive is acceptable to you because he's not accept, uh, aggressive to you, but he just hates other people. <laughs> and you happen to live in Arizona in a, in a shack uh, and uh, you don't get people that come over. And as a matter of fact, you uh, like a dog that's a little bit aggressive. And so that's acceptable to you. But to a family of, uh, of six uh, living in a residential neighborhood in Yorba Linda or Brea or Placentia, that may not be acceptable, all right? So hope that makes sense. So some things may just be acceptable and you're gonna have to determine that or uh, not. What is the path of training or correction? So what is it you're going to do um, and you're gonna have to know? So uh, in regard to the leash thing, what is it that I'm gonna do to get the dogs over the leash? Well, everything I do with a dog, it involves a leash right now. Um, in many cases, if I have a dog that has does not have a leash issue, um, I don't care. I just let the dog out. We've been beginning to play fetch. I don't bother putting a leash on because I know that I can control this dog. It's not that big of a deal, but because these dogs have a leash issue, I do the opposite, right? We flood the dog with leash experiences so that we can get the dog quickly over the leash issue so that I can go now to training the dog. And now the leash is not anything I have to be burdened with, or uh, the dog is not fearful of or concerned about. Uh, and so that's one path of training. If it is aggression, well, I get I get professional help. I come see a trainer over at Falco Canine Academy because we have experience in training aggressive dogs. And so I seek out those trainers that know how to deal with aggression because for whatever reason, I've decided that I love this dog. Uh, if without this dog in my life, he would be euthanized. And so now I need to find a path uh, and a person that can help me with this issue of aggression. And we have dealt with some aggression, I tell you. Um, 
Uh, I had a pit bull uh, in a family in uh, in Huntington Beach that we were training over at uh, at the park over there, and uh, uh, this dog was extremely aggressive. I'm just a monster, but they made it their um, life's work with this dog to give him a home and to uh, you know just take it. And 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 they came to training. They worked on it, and over time, we were able to get that dog to a place where they could walk that dog around the park with another dog, and even other dogs could come near him. And they were actually able to live with that dog, knowing that he had this little quirk. The little quirk. It was a huge quirk. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you about one training day. Uh, they had two dogs. They had a female dog there along with the male dog, and the uh, the woman uh, of the uh, husband and wife team uh, got into a little trouble with the uh, female dog. I think the, the leash was coming undone, and the dog was getting ready to get out of that. It, another pit bull, the female was, uh, was going to get ready to escape. And so I quickly went to go reach over to grab the dog, and the husband, who had this super aggressive dog, uh, was not thinking uh, about me <laughs> and was going to go help his wife and now brought his pit bull uh, to me. And I uh, had my back turned and the dog decided to take a bite out of my left butt cheek and uh, got a really good grip of my butt cheek there in training. Uh, thank God. Uh, thank God, literally, because I had visited Friends Church, which was at these at the park at the uh, convention center there. And I had the uh, the thing that they give you when you walk in, uh, you know, which talks about what's happening in church was in my pocket. And thank God the dog mostly got that in my pocket. So I only had two teeth in my butt and the other two teeth went into the, uh, the handout thing that they give you when you walk in. So yes. So we get them all. We get some pretty aggressive dogs. So um, coming to us, uh, we can work on that. I'll even take a bite for you. Uh, every so often, Derek or uh, um, no, we won't. We'll try not to take a bite for you. But um, what is it going to do to help uh, with that particular situation? Sorry, I went on that story there, but uh, it just uh, <laughs> reminded me of that story. All right. Uh, and then uh, how do you get the rest of the pack involved, right? So if you uh, do not live alone and you have a dog that has some issues, it really is going to be important that you get everybody else in the pack. The pack, obviously, are the rest of the human beings that live in the home with that dog. It, it will do hardly any good if you are the only one working with this dog because at some point you may get in trouble, especially when it comes to aggression or issues where it's going to be very challenging to keep this dog in the home. Dogs that escape and run down the road and irritate your neighbors, whether it's aggression or not, um, you got barking issues that you know will irritate everybody uh, that lives around you. And maybe you can, uh, the, and when the dog knows that when you're home, it's not allowed to bark. And so the dog does nothing when you're home, right? It's because you have done all the work, you've done all the training, you've maintained the behaviors. The dog understands that, and this happens with me, right? Dogs know that I have specific rules about living in this home, that you cannot do X, Y, and Z. And if you do, there's gonna be a consequence to it uh, but if you respect me, I'll respect you. If you love me, I will love you, that kind of relationship. But if they don't respect the wife or they don't respect the girlfriend or they don't respect the children, then um, <laughs> not all of those at once, um, then you're going to have problems, right? Because when you're not there, you're going to get barking, you're going to get aggression, and it's going to be bad, right? So you need to figure out how is it you're going to get the rest of the pack, the pack being the rest of the human beings that live in the house. Um, and if you're not, again, now you go back to rule number one. Is this just not going to work? Is just not a place for this dog to be? Is is everybody going to be unhappy as long as this dog lives or lives with you? In, in that case, what happens is the dog just lives in the backyard or a kennel and never gets to get out. That's no life for a dog. Uh, it, you know, if it's just frustrating for you to take your dog for a walk and you're thinking, you know, I'm going to go for a walk. You know, let's take the dog. And then everybody looks at each other and goes, nah, we want to enjoy our walk, right? And so now the dog stays. You want to be the answer is yes, we want to take the dog because we're so proud of our dog. You know, people, you know, comment all the time. Hey, you have the great, where'd you get that dog trained? You say Falco Canine Academy, or I watched a video on uh, Facebook Live, right? That's what you want when you take your dog for a walk. It's just like if you have children, you want people to say, you know, you have the best children. Uh, you, uh, you know, when we go to restaurants uh, with with my kids, uh, you know, there have been times where people go, you know what? You have a lot of, you know, we have experience in restaurants. We see people bring their kids in all the time. You know what? Your kids were really good. And we just wanted to let you know that we noticed that your kids, um, you know, sit in their seat and don't run around like crazy maniacs. And 
and uh, we really appreciate that as being you know people that visit restaurants and have to sit with people with kids and uh, and see what is what's going on. That's what you want, right? You want that that to happen. You want people to notice, uh, and you just simply want to not be burdened, you know, by a dog that's dragging you down the street or trying to bite other uh, dogs that may be walking on the same path. You want to be able to take your dog to Schlotsky's Deli so you can have lunch and not worry that they're gonna you know you know, suddenly run off into the parking lot. You want to be able to go to Starbucks or uh, coffee bean and, uh, and visit with people and, uh, and maybe even take the dog to the bank and that kind of stuff. So that's what you want. The relationship that is struggling because you are the only one who gets along with the dog or that you, uh, you know, did not fail fast and uh, decided to keep a dog that you knew was going to be a burden and your choice is not like the family Huntington Beach. They made a choice that they're going to work on it together as a team, the husband and wife. That's all they, that's, that was one of their main focuses was making sure that dog had a good life. And they were constantly working on making sure the dog, dog understood the, uh, the rules of going on a walk, that there's no aggression. Uh, there's no lunging out. There's no growling. And they were able to go on walks because together as a team, they were, they made that determination and they weren't going to leave that dog at home. They're, they're, their whole goal, even if they had to put a muzzle on that dog. And, and in the beginning they did, right? Because it was safe, but they wanted to get the dog out. Uh, the, the choice of, okay, do I leave the dog in the backyard or do we put a muzzle on the dog so we can take the dog to walk to begin the process of training the dog, the manners of, of being able to walk on a leash. All right, so let's go back here. Let me make sure that I covered all of my notes. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry, lost my presentation. Yeah. There it is. All right, we have one more. All right, so let's uh, go back here. And um, we got one more page. Oh, man. One more page. Thank you for sticking to me. So these are some of the things we want to look at. Is he a chewer? Uh, does he eat aggressively or timidly? Does he look at avenues of escape, fear of the leash, guarding, possessiveness, signs of food aggression? So when I'm looking at a dog, especially these bed bug dogs, these are all the things I want to know early on. So both these dogs can be a little bit of, uh, of chewers. They find things in the backyard. Uh, right now, I've got it down. Right now, they're leaving the uh, lawn furniture alone, um, but they do like plastic and um, some of the, 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 the fins that our kids use for um, uh, swimming and that kind of stuff. They've already... Uh, eaten a pair of those and a pair of my flip-flops that were back there. So I know that, but that's not going to keep them from being detection dogs, right? So I can work on that. We can work on what it is that they um, uh, do as far as the manners in regard to chewing stuff up. That's not that hard to work on. Uh, does he eat aggressively or timidly? Uh, Ollie eats aggressively. So we're going to uh, put um, a rock in his food to, to slow him down a little bit because he almost eats too much. That causes gas. Uh, and, um, just, it's not healthy for the dog to eat so fast. It's just gulping and just like, you know, coughing and eating so fast that it chokes that kind of thing. That's, um, Ollie, uh, flash does not, uh, look for avenues of escape. No, uh, they just look for avenues into the house. That's for sure. Um, and if you open up the door, they will bolt through, but that kind of stuff, but they're not jumping over fences or trying to, uh, you know, dig underneath the fence or the gate, uh, to get out. Guarding, no guarding with these dogs. Fear of the leash. Uh, yes, not, I'm not sure. Fear is just they don't know. So you have there's a difference between a fear of a leash and um, uh, uneasiness with a leash because they just never had one on before. I think that's what it is. So I, we're able to get them over the the, the leash thing. Guarding possessiveness. Uh, I've been able to pick up the, the food bowl and put it back down. I can take the ball out of their mouth. As a matter of fact, they drop the ball in their mouth. So we don't have possessive issues. And then uh, go, uh, what I just talked about was no signs of aggression. So we don't have any of that. So that's all good. So those are the, some of the things I look for early on in the beginning. And there's others. That's, of course, not the entire list. But it's a good portion of the list of the things that you want to make sure and check out. Hey, Gina. Oh, what are you laughing about? Sorry, I missed why you were laughing. Uh, Gina just joined us and says, hi, Gina, our trainer over there at Falco K9 OC. Um, does a great job. If you, uh, again, any of these things that I'm talking about um, and you just don't have the knowledge or what worked with your other dog is not working with this dog, you got to call us. You, you, we can't help you uh, just necessarily online always. Now, I do have a lot of training videos, have a lot of uh, stuff like that that will help you, but I think that the videos go hand in hand with the active training, with the, the training that... Um, Oh, the butt bite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It really hurt. Um, and so um, 
with Gina and, and, and Derek and Michelle and uh, all the other trainers that we have that are out there on the field that uh, can help you with all of these issues is that it, it really helps to have that along with the video training, the membership sites and that kind of stuff. So really works better. Now, of course, if you're in another state or uh, too far away to drive, then our videos surely will help you uh, in regard to whatever issues you have with your dog. So don't uh, hesitate to get into one of our training programs, whether it's online or with uh, Gina and Derek and the rest of the crew. Uh, but Gina's fantastic. Um, uh, She's worked for me for years and, and Derek and we all are on the same program. It's about uh, training your dog with love and respect. Super, super important. Um, we do have a, a sense of discipline, but it's done with love. And again, it's, it's done with respect. It, it, the dog has to understand that there's rules, not bolting out the door. When we go out a door, we want the dog to sit and wait while we turn the doorknob and open it up. And then we can either walk out together or the human walks through first and then the dog walks through. We want the dog to sit and wait to be told that it's okay to eat out of the bowl. We want the dog to look into our eyes because we want that acknowledgement that the dog understands that we provide the food, we provide the water. Uh, when we walk, we don't wanna be drugged down the street. Uh, when we pass another dog, we want our dog to not become aggressive and, and try to get to the other dog, whether it's in play or aggression, right? And so all of these things are super important with our detection dogs and our pet dogs. And um, that's the kind of uh, uh, program that we have here. All right. So go, feel free and uh, get a hold of us if you need some help with your dogs. Uh, put in your questions. Uh, today, I forgot to put in the link. Oh, well, uh, I got into a hurry. Um, we have a free report for training your dog with love and, re love and respect. If you go to one of our other postings here in Falco Canyon Academy, you'll see it on there. It's a link. Just click on that. Just put in your name and email address and I'll send you the free report. And then we have a program that I think you really enjoy. It's uh, Dog Park Etiquette. And it's only $9 to get in there. It actually helps you use a dog park in the way that will actually increase your obedience and relationship between you and your dog. Uh, the one thing that I think uh, that, that I, I often said is that dog parks can be a horrible experience. And they're not the best places for your dog if you don't have a plan. If you're going there simply to just let your dog run with other dogs, you could be asking for trouble because you never know who's going to be there. There can be people bringing their dogs there because, you know, my dog's really aggressive. Maybe I'll go to the dog park to see if I can work on that aggression uh, and we'll, you know, let them be around other dogs. And that happens, right? Uh, you have people that send their dog out and then turn and have a conversation with whoever it is they came with or want to pick up on, you know, uh, you know their, their next date, right? That's not really what the dog park is for. The dog park is good for socialization, yes. But the most important thing is a relationship between you and your dog. That's the most important thing at a dog park. How do you work on that at a dog park? The program that I put together really does address that and helps the dog park be a better experience for you and your dog. And again, makes that relationship stronger because if you put in a plan before you go to the dog park, it actually can be a good place to go. All right, so that is it. I hope this was helpful to you uh, in regard to uh, bringing the new dog into the, into the home. Um, I'm currently putting together a program for people that are getting new dogs, uh, namely puppies, but it'll also be good for even adult dogs that are coming from rescues and um, uh, shelters. And so look for that as I'm building it. Uh, I'm going to be using some of these presentations uh, to be together. If you think I missed anything in the presentation that you are watching now, please go ahead and comment and say, you know what, could you talk more about blah and less about your butt get bit by a pit bull? Or uh, can you talk about, um, you know, this issue I'm having with my dog? Uh, are you going to have anything about that? I, I need to know because it's really hard to uh, address your issue if I don't know about it. So in the comment section, when you get a chance, go ahead and write in the uh, comment section what it is that you want to hear about and what it is that you need to learn about your dog. And if I don't know, you know what? I'll bring an expert on that does. I'll find them. All right. And so we will definitely do that. Can't see the new... Oh, can't wait. Yes. Yes. I can't wait to see them either. <laughs> I still got to produce them. Um, I'm going to use uh, the, the, the bed bug dogs because they're only a year old. So they're, they're puppies. Um, many puppies are, or many dogs are puppies for up to three years. Uh, strangely enough, I know uh, Rottweilers are uh, one of those dogs in particular who take a long time to mature and sometimes almost never mature. Right. And so, um, German Shepherds right around two, almost three years of age for total maturity. That's why we don't often, um, take German Shepherds and make them police dogs until after they're about a year and a half. Uh, even so, it's up to two years uh, until really we can trust that that dog is going to be mature enough to handle police work. So um, it is uh, uh, not just a year. Uh, dogs are really puppies uh, for longer than a year in, in many cases. And so we have to be really careful. So these dogs here uh, from Northern Ireland, I keep pointing because they're off to my right out here in the backyard. Um, 
uh, in this first year of their life in this training process, really important to be careful and to really take each step one day at a time. There's days where we hardly do anything other than I go out there and pet them and just hang out with them. It's about building that relationship. And then we hit it hard with training hard and fast and we get through it and it goes really fast. But without that relationship, without that bond, without that trust, then training will not happen. The dog just will not uh, uh, flourish as we want him to do. All right. Again, hope that all was helpful. Uh, make sure and leave a comment as to what it is that you want to hear on these broadcasts. Thank you, Gina, for joining me and anybody else. I see that there's other people on, but they've not made themselves known. So just hi to you. I don't know who you are. Um, and uh, again, um, uh, if you need our help, just go ahead and contact us here at Falco Cannon Academy, and we will do our best to help you with whatever situation you may be in with your dog. All right, take care, and I'll see you at the next one. Bye.